Hey guys, it's Austin at Know Your Music, and it's late at night, I'm still at work, and I just, I had this thought that I, I don't know, I kind of felt like I needed to share because nobody else is sharing this thought, and it seems like it's a little bit passe at this point in time, but there is some modern, um, sort of a modern, uh, what, what would be the word here? Anyway, this is still happening right now, okay? Let me talk to you just for a second about a man named J.R. Richards. Now, he's a rock and roll singer, um, and honestly, to, to, to branch out just a little bit further, he's a blues singer, he's a soul singer, uh, he's a pop singer. This guy can sing anything. <clears throat> he could open up the phone book and just start singing people's names. And it would sound soothing. The cool thing about this guy is he's been doing it for a long time now. A long time. Okay. Um, he was the lead singer, guitar player, keyboard player, programmer, songwriter for a band called Dishwalla, which you may remember from a song called Counting Blue Cars back in the late 90s. The problem with that is that is sort of their... Uh, how do I put this? That was their contribution to rock radio at the time. Nothing more. That's where they uh, they got on the radio. They got their name out there. They got their video out there. And everybody sort of knew their faces at that point in time. But that's not what the band was. Now, J.R. Richards is still very heavily active in the music community. He is a singer, songwriter, guitar player. He still plays a little bit of piano. I, he just does all the things that he did back in the band in their heyday. But he's doing it on his own now. He's a lot more stripped back, uh, a lot more acoustic than the band was before. It's, it's a different sort of sound, but it's still the same sort of sound, if you know what I'm saying. JR has that voice that, I kid you not, uh, he has not lost a step at all. This guy could still sing like he did in the 90s and in the early 2000s. He still sounds as full, as pure, as rich, and really as youthful as he did back then with the professional... I mean, he, he didn't sound like a kid back in the day. He sounded like an absolute pro, which is exactly how he sounds today. So just to touch on this for a little bit here, I just want to go out and say, you got to check these guys out. His old band, Dishwalla, in 1995, they released their debut album called Pet Your Friends. Obviously, that's where the song came from. The big hit single was uh, Counting Blue Cars. Everybody kind of knew that song back in 95, 96, 97 when it was all over the radio. However, that is an 11-track album. If you buy the American Standard version of the album, it's an 11-track album. And I, I'm not kidding you when I say that that single was... This sounds blasphemous. But it's the worst song on the entire album. And that's not to take anything away from that hit song. What I mean by that is there are 10 other tracks on that album that absolutely rock my world. That entire album, start to finish, is amazing. And there are there are some really deep, soft, touching, and moody areas in that album. Countered with some very dark, crunchy, rocking guitars. Thumping rhythm sections. Their bass player, Scott Alexander, is just a... He's a master at his craft. Uh, the drummer back on the first album, uh, George uh, Pendergast, uh, Pendergast was also just a just an amazing leader of a rhythm section. Rodney Browning was always the guitar player for the band. He's still the guitar player for the band for these days. Scott's still there on bass guitar. That first album, I could list you every song and tell you an amazing uh, an amazing thing throughout each one of those songs. The cool thing is, is none of them sounded like their contemporaries. None of these songs sounded like they were taking from anybody else at that point in time. Now, they would fit nicely 
into that groove, into that pocket of post-grunge or sort of hard alternative rock at the time. But they didn't sound like anybody else. Even through their entire, really their entire heyday of a career, they just did not, they had their own sound. Nobody sounded like these guys. Their second album in 1998 is called And You Think You Know What Life Was All About. They they expanded to a five-piece band at that point in time. So JR would spend a little bit more time at the front. He would be more of a microphone-holding lead singer. Of course, he still played guitar and so forth. They hired Jim Wood as a keyboard player. He also did backup and harmony vocals. It fit perfectly. It was the absolute natural progression from that first album. And again, a 12-track album you will find no skippable songs. This is hard to do. Now, for a band to do this for one album, that's amazing. But for a band to continue to do this sort of thing where you don't want to skip past any track, it's unheard of. And these guys have done this now with album number two. Now, it took them a couple of years, but in 2002, they released Opaline, which was their third album. And again, it's the same five-piece band, except for George is gone now. The drummer, the original drummer is gone. They've got Pete Maloney in here on drums. Guy is perfect fit. Absolutely perfect fit. If these guys were all to get back together... I would almost feel bad if they left out Pete or George. It almost seems like if they were to go on a reunion tour of some kind, they would need to have both drummers because they both fit so perfectly well. Opaline is a little bit more mellow overall than its predecessors, but again, some of the heavier and higher, harder notes, uh, they they even tower over uh, a couple of the originals. So it's got um, sort of a broader range still fits nicely in that pocket of Dishwalla sound. Their fourth album was a live record called uh, Live Greetings from the Flow State, which I I mean, I really appreciate that title. Um, being My son is into uh, martial arts and the Bruce Lee thing so frequently uh, these days, and the Chuck Norris and all that stuff. The, the, the Flow State, it, it's a great title. It's a great title, and you can really feel it on this album. It's, just, it's a simple single disc, 12 track live album where they play just a, a smattering of songs from their first three albums and really just do them so much justice. And this, the production quality on the album is terrific. Um, the performance is absolutely top notch. They really could have released this without crowd noise as a best of album and it would have fit exactly in that spot. Absolutely perfect. Um, within their sort of original, almost original lineup, they did release one more self-titled album in 2005 called Dishwalla, obviously. Um, which, again, it, it, you don't have JR playing on the keyboards, but he does still play some guitar on the record. It's a really um, straightforward rock album, but it still flourishes with that... Um, sort of, uh, boy, you know, the, the word I'm looking for is really escaping me here, but they've got these sonic textures, which just sort of ebb and flow throughout each of their albums. It was, it's almost as if you took their first four studio albums and just put them on shuffle, you would get this nice, um, just sort of, uh, oh man, this feeling that, it, it it lulls you and then it kicks you and then it lulls you and then it kicks you. It's an amazing feeling throughout these four records and each song just does something completely different. Whereas you can't, like I said, they fit nicely into that post grunge slash alternative rock um, genre set, but you just can't put a finger on any influences you can't really grasp who they've taken their sound from because they are so original even throughout this point in time now this is going on 11 years at this point in time and you just don't see or feel or hear their influences because they are so original and they've done so much on their own they just have this sound 
I really liken it to uh, a band like Semisonic, uh, just because it's it's so different from what anybody else was doing at that time. Now they do not sound like Semisonic, uh, but the, the reason I say that is just that's exactly it. Is because they were so different from what everybody else was doing. They rocked. Uh, they they lulled. Uh, they you could almost really the. the 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 songs that that felt like ballads you could almost sing as lullabies to your children in the crib and yet you could still pump your fist and just rock along with these guys it's an amazing sound that permeated these first four studio albums plus that live album that i mentioned that you won't get anywhere else and i, I promise you you won't find this anywhere else and I just wanted to get on here and just say, honestly, check them out. They had some singles. They had a few videos, a few official music videos, not a lot of them. But I, I, I would say that if you're only looking at YouTube to find their music videos to go along with the singles they released, you're really, really missing out. Because they created four pieces of music that really felt like they were meant to go together as a whole. They need to be listened to on a disc from start to finish. Not not a cassette or a record where you would flip it over to side B, but it really, really needs to be listened to on a compact disc where you can just push play and play it all the way through and um, just kind of get that entire feeling uh, for what they were going for. And it really it molds together so well that if you were to cut a track out or if you were to hit skip or something, you really would be missing something that they were trying to put forward at that point in time. The only other thing that I would mention uh, just sort of up front here is, and, and obviously if you bought the Japanese version of their first album, Pet Your Friends, you would get this bonus track. Uh, but for us here in the United States where we're not really, it's hard to find the Japanese version of that album. It really is, unless you go on Discogs and, and pay uh, an arm and a leg for it. There was a Carpenter's Tribute album out um, in 1995, which is actually it was a little bit before they released their first album. But they did the track It's Going to Take Some Time by the Carpenters. I think that was written by Carol King originally, actually, but it was performed and made famous by the Carpenters. And right from the get-go, you can feel now they've they obviously like the song. This is why they've picked it, and they really do it justice. However, as soon as the song really picks up, like as soon as the piano intro is over, which is very short, you get an idea of oh, so this is who Dishwalla is. And they wrap their entire sound up so perfectly in this song. It's it's where you would need to start. If you're going to listen to this band and listen to those four albums plus the live album that I gave you the names of, you got to start back here at It's Going to Take Some Time. If you look it up, it's everywhere. It's not hard to find. Check that out and then dig into their discography. I promise you, if you are into rock music... Um, if you are into singers who are honed in on their craft and then and then guitar players who are not only lead but also part of the rhythm section and a bass player and a drummer who hold down just an absolutely textbook perfect groove you cannot miss this band now, I would go back as far as to say if you're a fan of the classic Rolling Stones all the way through, if you're a fan of Creed or Nickelback even, uh, they don't sound like any of those three bands. However, they've got that pocket that they fit into. And what they do is they boil over outside of that pocket and they give you something that is like a bouquet of fresh smelling flowers that have metal tips on them. I don't know how else to describe this band. If you don't know them, you need to go check them out. Rock and roll music, um, maybe alternative rock, like I said, post-grunge, even grunge, um, 
modern pop with guitar driven sound anything in those areas if you're a fan or even just a a semi fan of those genres you would really be doing yourself a favor to check this group out now things have changed obviously since uh since uh, 2017 they they do have a new singer um and Pete Maloney who was the replacement drummer who filled in from their third album onward he's still there so it's not the original drummer it's not the original singer however the 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 backbone the foundation of that band is still there i i send uh jr richards messages on facebook and on his website i haven't heard anything back yet of course who am i to hear anything back but i've told him and i stand by it if they were to ever get back together whether it be with Pete or George on drums, if they got that original band back together and did one more album, I would feel like my musical life was complete. That is how amazing these guys were. Now, I will not take away anything from their current sound. They're a terrific band, and they still tour. Like I said, they released another album. They're working on something else now, as far as I uh, understand. They sound terrific. However, to... Break off to the side for a second. J.R. Richards is also a solo artist. He has released his own albums on his website. You can buy them on disc. You can buy some of them on vinyl. You can buy. You can download them just directly from his website. The man is incredible at keeping touch with his fans, uh, more so than any other popular musician I've ever come across. So he's very personable, uh, still has that amazing voice that he always had which is just you can't find another singer really that goes from hard rock to mellow soulful ballads as seamlessly as this man does you just can't uh the only thing that i could even think of that would compare to him would be chris cornell from soundgarden and audio slave and obviously from his uh temple of the dog days and from his solo records where he went through four completely different sounds of music and just fit right into that sound so well. Um, and the cool thing is, is actually JR did a video where he played a Chris Cornell song, or well, I guess it was a Soundgarden song, but anyway, just a snippet of it. And just sort of as a small tribute to the man, JR himself kind of realizes, as humble as he is, that that is where he fits, is into that Chris Cornell mold. Mind you, the band does not sound like Soundgarden. They don't sound like Temple of the Dog. They don't sound like Audio Slave. But as far as his talent as a singer and a songwriter and a musician goes, that's really the only place I could put him in. I would say something along the lines of a Sammy Hagar, but Dishwalla didn't really ever have that party Van Halen sound to them. Uh, it was a lot more serious, even though they still had fun with the serious you need to listen to these guys. You need to check out these albums. Um, if if you haven't, you're missing out on a lot. If you've only heard the singles and only watched... The, I'm so sorry I dropped you guys. If you've only heard the singles and only watched the videos on YouTube, you've missed out on so much, so much amazing music, songwriting, and vocals. Please, please check them out. Uh, this is sort of my PSA for Dishwalla and J.R. Richards and Scott Alexander and Rodney uh, Rodney Browning and, like I said, George P. and uh, Jim and Pete. This is my public service announcement. Do these guys a favor and do yourself a favor and check out Dishwalla. And uh, thanks for listening. I've got some more content coming, as I always do. And uh, I will uh, talk to you guys soon. Thank you very much.